chapter 9, I will remind those who are uh, watching, well, wherever they're watching from, but they're watching on our Facebook uh, page, uh, that this coming weekend, uh, Saturday and Sunday, we have a conference here. Uh, it begins on 9.30 each day. Uh, Saturday, we're going 9.30. We're having lunch. We're going to about 5, and we'll dismiss everyone to, to find some supper. Um, and then we'll meet back here 9.30 and 11, our usual times on Sunday. So we invite you to come in person uh, and be part of that. Uh, and um, uh, if you haven't met us yet, come and, and meet us uh, and, and all of those things. Um, but for right now, Romans chapter 9. And we kind of, you know, last week we, we started going through, people have mercy on you, people have mercy. And... Uh, you know, it's hard to not stop in the middle of a, a thought, uh, so we're going to have to pick up in verse 18. I'll do a very quick uh, reminder, uh, but that's all going to happen after I have a word of prayer. Uh, God, Father, once again, uh, we come before you in prayer. And, Father, I don't know what we have gone through this week. Maybe it was a good week for us. Maybe it was an enjoyable week. And, Father, now I just, uh, well... I pray that uh, you were remembered throughout this week, but, but Father, I just pray our focus now is on the truth of your word. And Father, maybe there were some things, we had some difficult things we had to deal with this week, but again, Father, I just pray that our minds are drawn toward your goodness. And that today we can be reminded that you know what you are doing. Uh, and Father, what you do, it is done perfectly well. And, um, well, I just pray our understanding is, is opened and expanded as we get into your word today. I pray all these things in the, the name of, well, the word, our life, our salvation, Jesus Christ. Amen. So Romans chapter 9, and I guess we will start back in verse, I don't know, let's just start in 14. Uh, it says, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore, he will have mercy on whom he has mercy, and uh, on whom he will ha uh, he will have mercy, and on whom he will harden it. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why does he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the power power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the, the riches of his glory unto the vessels of mercy, which he hath prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So as I focus your attention back on verse 18, uh, we've been through uh, how God, uh, we've been through mercy and, and how God had showed uh, mercy to Moses. Uh, well, first of all, he showed mercy to the people 
Moses was leading, as he didn't wipe them out after they worshipped the golden calf, but, but he also showed a, a unique mercy to Moses uh, in that he allowed Moses to look upon the remnants of his glory. Uh, and um, so he will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. And then in verse 18 it says, and whom he will hardeneth. Now this word hardeneth, uh, it's, it's used metaphorically, it's to render obstinate or stubborn. Uh, some of you, when I say uh, uh, hardens, uh, you think, oh, I know someone who, who's stubborn. Um, and sometimes a donkey gets a bad rap as being obstinate. Uh, but, but that's what it means, to, 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 to render stubborn. Uh, the word will here, uh, whom he will hardeneth, whom he will resolve or, or determine or, or purpose to, to stubbornness. So what we have here, uh, when we tie this back into verse 18, is that God resolved to use Pharaoh as an example of his power and glory. Uh, by resisting, by Pharaoh, by resisting God's word, God's uh, command to him to release people from bondage, uh, by, by being stubborn toward that, that demand, uh, what Pharaoh did is, is he allowed God to bring forth a deliverance that was talked about throughout the world. Uh, and that was miraculous in its, in its very nature. And, and the deliverance, instead of the people just kind of walking away, it took upon itself, uh, it, it assumed a more spectacular uh, aspect than it would have otherwise. Uh, because Pharaoh said no, or he said yes and then changed his mind to no, all of these plagues came upon uh, the Egyptians. And God's power was seen in each and every one of them. He, and while he, he, he decided, he determined to use Pharaoh for that, uh, uh, for that use, just like he determined to use Moses to show uh, his, his, uh, his glory, and that, that Moses' face had to be covered for days after he was on the mountain being uh, with God. I think we talked about last week, but in case I forgot or we didn't, uh, let me just ask you some more questions, or let me just point out to you that God, what, what we have here is God chose, God determined to use that Pharaoh. We don't know why it wasn't the Pharaoh before, or the Pharaoh before him, or the Pharaoh after him, or the Pharaoh after him, but it was that Pharaoh that God was going to ask to do something that God knew he wasn't going to want to do. And by God's sovereign uh, purpose, his power was, was seen. And so we are never going to have a biography, this side of glory at least, entitled The Pharaoh That Showed the, That Declared the Power of God. We get to read that, oh, this Pharaoh as a young boy, he liked uh, camels. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, we're not going to know all those details, but guess what? We don't need to know them. Because really, this story is not you and I's story. It's not Pharaoh's story. It's not Moses' story. It's his story. A creation was created to bring glory uh, to God. Uh, when I was reading through Witherington, uh, he quotes a gentleman by the name of N.T. Wright. And he says this, and it's a good reminder. He says, reading this part of Romans is like riding a bicycle. If you stand still for more than a moment, forgetting the onward mo movement both of the story of 9.6 through, through 10.21 and of the letter as a whole, you are liable to lose your balance. Then he goes on to say, proof texting or taking certain verses of the section out of the flow and context and tra trajectory of the rhetorical argument has led to all sorts of bad theology. When the effect of an argument is intended to be cumulative, so in other words, Paul's argument builds. It's not meant to be piecemeal uh, or cut and dissected and, and we'll use this somewhere else. So when the, when the intent of the argument is tend to be cumulative, uh, and there are deliberate, there is deliberately an ebb and flow, so it goes from here and naturally to here. Uh, assertions and then qualifications, so uh, that means uh, he makes a statement and then he qualifies it further. He expands upon that statement further. Uh, when all of these are involved in it, it is a major mistake to focus on one or another verse to get at Paul's theology, uh, especially of election and the like. 
and I like that because Romans, let me think this through real quick, perhaps more than any other book, Romans has to be, any verse you're at in Romans, the verses before and what's to come have to be taken into account. Uh, it is a it is a lo it is a, log uh, a logical argument that that naturally moves from one point to another. Uh, it makes a statement. It expands upon it, uh, and so be very careful. Proof that. And I, I use the example of Romans uh, three twenty three, uh, and we use that not incorrectly, but most of the time we use that uh, to, to show that we're we're all sinners. But in the context, the main point of it is to show that it doesn't matter if you're Jew and Gentile, you're a sinner and need God's grace. Uh, so again, I, I, don't, I don't mean to nitpick, uh, and I want you to understand we, we don't use that wrongly, but I always miss the context of that verse until I went and read through what kept it in its context, because as a child, you're always, used it, you're always uh, using it for this certain um, uh, reason, and uh, unfortunately, I missed the entirety of the content. So I don't mean to keep harping on that, but Romans is a book. It has to be. It's very hard for me to stand up here each week and keep everything in its context. Uh, and so uh, the point is that God has been going of this, this section here is that God has been going through, uh, as, he, as we go through what we call the times and the ages, God has sovereignly acted to extend at times mercy to people like Moses. Uh, and other times he has held people accountable like Pharaoh. Uh, and, uh, and when God has done that, it has benefited Israel in the past. Um, so he has brought these up to get to verse 24, where he says, as glad as they were to have Moses receive that and Pharaoh receive that in the past, they should be equally glad that God has sovereignly acted to extend mercy to Gentiles today. And also that he has the authority to do so. It's kind of like as a, I know none of you have ever had this thought, but uh, if you have siblings, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and if you have an especially irritating sibling, I don't want to know their name, um, especially if you only have one other one. But, and you know, they were doing something to you that was just irking you, and they got caught. And you took pleasure in the fact that, ha ha, you know, mom and dad are, man, they are bringing down their authority now. You liked it when it happened to him or her, not so much when you got caught. That's so unfair! So, uh, we need to be, we like when things happen to benefit us here, not so much when, when other people receive the benefit. And so that's what's happening here. Paul is bringing this, this into a, first of all, he's establishing God has the authority to do, to make these such choices. Uh, and he's made a choice that benefits all uh, today. And we need to be equally, they needed to be, and we need to be equally uh, excited about uh, that. Uh, and he's going to go on, he lays this out. In chapter 9, so then verse 11, uh, he, can, he can show that God is using, God is right to, to extend mercy to Gentiles. Turn forward to chapter 11. Let me just read a few verses. I realize I'm getting ahead of myself, but uh, this is where it's all going. Romans 11, verse 7. Ready? I'm going to go quickly. What then? Israel hasn't obtained that which she, so she seeks for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest... We're blinded. Jump down to verse 25. Uh, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Jump down to verse 31 and 32. It says, As even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. And guess what God, or Paul, the Holy Spirit, has already established in two chapters earlier. God will have mercy upon whom he will have mercy. And so uh, we are going to get to the section where, where Paul announces that Israel was blinded or, or hardened so that all, including the Gentiles, could might 
might benefit from the mercy of God. So that's what's upcoming. All right, and I just kind of give you that little teaser uh, of what's to come in a few chapters. Well, let's go back to chapter 9 and let's move on to verse 19. So, so if God's going to have mercy on whom he has mercy and whom he hardens, he hardens. Uh, who's at fault? How can God hold anyone accountable? Uh, verse 19 says, the word, um, uh, when it says, who hath resisted his will, it's a, it's a different word than back in verse, uh, where was it? Oh, uh, verse 16. Uh, so you have to kind of remember back to last week or go back and watch last week. But, but here it means a, a purpose. Uh, he has, uh, who has resisted his purpose. God has a purpose and who has, who has um, uh, went against the flow of it. Another thing I want to want to point out to you is that when it says "who hath resisted," it's in the perfect tense, and what that means is to to set one's defense against it, to withstand it, to resist it, to oppose it. So you have this this purpose, and who has successfully stood against it or was unmoved by it? How can that person be held accountable? How can God hold us accountable? Because who withstands God's purpose? And it's very important, I believe, how Paul answers. Paul answers not with a theological explanation. He answers with a series of questions. Of questions. And, and what he does here, he never offers here or anywhere else a logical solution to the tension between divine sovereignty and human will, uh, or human responsibility. Uh, what he does is he takes an approach much like God answered Job uh, by reminding, when God reminded Job of who he was, and brought him to a point where Job says, I should have trusted you. And that's what Paul is bringing these people and you and I to a point where, look, if you believe everything you know about God, that he is good, that he is right, you can trust him. Why would we think we know better than God? That uh, God is who he is and he does. He has divine authority over all creation. And so let's go through uh, Paul's reply. Verse 20, he says, no, but O man, who are you that replies against God? Um, and so he reminds us of our place. Our responsibility is to take God at his word and trust him. He says in verse, uh, he basically says, on the contrary, O man. And what this does is is it accentuates the, the chasm or the divide that the gulf, the, the huge gulf that exists between God and the O man. So who are you, O man, to reply against God? Far from, again, we would all love because we like to be in the know. We like to have all the information. You know, we like those videos, how it's made sometimes how it's made, or behind the scenes, or we like to get all that extra information. We like to feel like we're an insider, and then we can go tell everyone, hey, I know how them there hot dogs are made, please don't tell me, all right, <laughs> things like that. Uh, we want to know, we want to get into the mind of God, but here's the thing, I don't know if we can handle it in our limited capacity. And really, I know we don't like to hear it, but right now, as long as we are tied to the flesh, we still, at some level, think selfishly. How this affects us. And so, Paul, again, the Holy Spirit inspires Paul to give the perfect answer for reminding us of the place that we have in, in, um, in, uh, in, in, in creation or, or in comparison to God. Uh, it doesn't satisfy the ego, uh, but, but Paul abruptly points right to the anyone who is objecting and he sharply asks who are you to question God and God is God and the creature has no right to reply against or to criticize his maker uh, human beings are not in nor will they ever be in uh, a position to answer back to 
God or to talk back to God any more than a vase is in a position to criticize the one who made it uh, a certain way. The word repiest in verse uh, 20, it, it really is to answer back by contradicting. It's to talk back. That's what it means. Talk back. Um, it implies a spirit of contention. Ooh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get before God and I'm gonna tell him a thing or two. You did this wrong, and, and why'd you do this? And uh, uh, I've said it many times as I stood behind this pulpit. That is not going to happen. On the day you stand before God, if you haven't seen it yet, you certainly will that day. That this is a holy God who only does right, and I am unworthy to stand in His presence. And prayerfully. Each and every one of us acknowledges that before that day comes. And the, the first step in acknowledging that is to acknowledge that we are all unworthy, we are all dead in trespasses and sins, and we need to trust in the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins on a cross. He was buried. He rose again so that we... Can, can be saved from sin and death. And we can be made a new creation in Jesus Christ. You know, that word repious. I, I mentioned Job earlier. We're in, we're in Romans chapter 9. Uh, but I'm going to just quote a few verses from Job. Uh, Job 16.21. It's just a verse I picked out where basically Job's saying, well, let me just read it to you. It says, Oh, that one might plead for a man with God. As a man pleads for his neighbor. And so Job, look, I, I understand. I don't want to be, make it seem like I'm giving Job a bad rap. No, he, he didn't, uh, he didn't uh, curse God. So not so much to talk back to God, but to plead his case before God. And then God showed a mercy to Job. He spoke to him. And he spoke to him not by saying, Job, here's why this happened. If you would have just trusted me. You would have, I would have told you that Satan came and he, I, was, I was letting Satan use you as, as an example of faithfulness. Oh yeah, thanks. You know, he didn't do that. What God does is he shows up and he reminds Job who he was and who Job was. Uh, and his very first words out of his mouth. Uh, here's, a, here's a few examples from Job 38, 1 through 4. The Lord answered Job, if, uh, if you plan to debate God one day, or to later today, or if you did this past week, I expect to have an experience like the Pharisees. They were always trying to trip him up, but I'm sure they sat around, how can we get him? Oh yeah, that's a great idea. Let's go right now and let's get him. Let's ask him that question and he's never going to be able to answer this. And guess what? Luke 14, 6 says this. And this pretty much sums up every one of their experiences when they tried to contend against Jesus Christ. Luke 14, 6 says, and they could not answer him again to these things. Jesus gave the perfect answer that they were left saying, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Who are you to contend against God? Who are you that replies uh, against God? Uh, Paul asks here. He goes on and he brings into his shall the thing form say to him that formed it, Why has you made why hath you made me thus? Uh, I am so glad <coughs> that our um, our pitchers and our pots and all of those things, uh, they're not like they are in Beauty and the Beast. They don't talk to us. Um, I think they may have some, ex they have the good plates, right? Do you, you guys have the good plate, the good china? And you have, and you're just my family, you use the, the, the bad plates. But no, the company's coming, so now the good plates, and you better not ruin the good plates. Uh, you know, if I were a bad plate, I'd be thinking, hey man, I don't want to have why do I have spaghetti on me every day of the week or food on me every day of the week? Why is this kid like spitting out his broccoli on me every day? <laughs> Why can't I be one of the good plates? I get, to, I get to sit in the cabinet most of the year. But guess what? Those things don't get to ask, don't, don't get to criticize you for how you use them. Uh, it's, and so Paul brings in this, this analogy. Uh, and I'm just going to read a few verses from Isaiah. We don't have time to turn to them, write them down, look at them later. But Isaiah 29, 16. And I want you to just see this, this potter and the clay analogy. It's not just used here. It's used elsewhere. And in each case, the main thought is that 
Just as the clay allows the potter to form it into what it needs to be, we need to allow the Lord to use us for his honor and for his glory. Isaiah 29, 16, it says this, Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that madeth, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding? So this is a very good cross-reference for here. I'm basically asking, shall the, the base say, Hey, what? you don't know what you're doing, do you? Uh, this is a much better way. No, uh, the potter forms the clay. Then in Isaiah 45, I'm going to read 9, 10, 11, 12. Uh, Isaiah 45, 9 says, Woe unto him that strives with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioned it, Why makest me? Why makest thou? Uh, or thy work? He hath no hands. Woe unto him that saith unto the Father, Why did you beget? Why did you beget you? Or to the women, Why hast you brought, brought forth? Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his Maker, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons, and concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. I have made the earth, and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their hosts have I commanded. Here's the, if you didn't get all that, basically here's what it's saying. Uh, now maybe in their teenage years you've heard them say this, but I've never had a baby, uh, mainly because they can't talk, uh, but turn to his mom and say, hey man, why am I out here? Uh, you know, and, and just have this list of complaints. Um, uh, and so here, the, the main thought is much like Paul's trying to get across. Is the Lord has created the earth and all that is in it, including man. Uh, he is the sovereign. We can trust him. Because I guarantee you, I guarantee you, if you are going to take an opposing side against the Lord, you're on the wrong side. And that's the main thought here. We can't view this from human, uh, from human experience. I know as a parent, I have not always, uh, I can say this because uh, I'm alone today, but uh, I know I have not always made the best choices. I know that my parents haven't always made the best choices. Uh, I know you, and we've all made mistakes. So to, to, uh, to, to take the human experience and say, I know better than so-and-so, and I wouldn't have done this if I were them, and if I were the boss, I would do it this way, and all those things. Look, that, that, is, that is not a good comparison between us and the Lord. Hey, I live here. I know what I would do. The Lord knows what he's doing. And we need to come to that point uh, where we trust him. Uh, and uh, like Israel could be thinking, hey, wait a minute. This is kingdom was at hand. How can you do this to us? That's not right. And Paul's reminding them, are you that he created? And remember, Israel itself, that nation is called the work of the Lord's hand. He created them. He formed them. He molded them. Are they going to talk back to this decision that the Creator made? I'm not going to try to rush through the, the, the rest of these <laughs> verses. But that is a good, humble place to stop and consider. I don't know what you... Uh, look, I know I kind of get what you went through last year and, and still this year. And that was a mess. Still is a mess. <laughs> All these differences of opinion and, and man, uh, really digging in uh, of what we think is right. I don't know how you've been hurt in the past. I don't know how you've been hurt yesterday or how you'll be hurt tomorrow or a few weeks from now. I don't know the times you had successes, the times you felt uh, you accomplished something. I do know is that through it all, what 
whatever circumstance we are in, we can trust the sovereign Lord. And you're probably like me. You know that the ungrateful humanity would never have lasted 2,000 years under your grace. And that's when we can stop and say, Lord, thank you that, uh, that you are you and I'm me. And that for all of these years, your main purpose that all be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, it is still being seen. You still have, have offered salvation to anyone of any country, of, from any family, of any social status, status of, any, of any skin color, of any whatever it is. No barrier makes us closer or farther away from God. But that Jesus Christ is that one way back to God. So that's what we're going to read in verse 10. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, trust in his death, his burial, his resurrection shall be saved. And I'll tell you, I don't know if you, we're all humans, I don't know if you ever say, God, what are you doing? Why am I going through this? Why are you? Why is this, why is this going on? Uh, why so long? All these things. What a reminder to just sit and dwell on the things we do know. And say, Lord, God, you have blessed us so much. And if nothing else, I have learned you know what you're doing, and I can trust you. And until the day when things might become a little bit clearer, honestly, I think in that day, uh, we're not going to care. Um... Help me share what I do know. That we have a good God who provided salvation through his son. Uh, let's pray. God, Father, thank you for this reminder. I know we all have... If, if we were... If, we, if I were to ask, okay, what kind of questions would you ask? You know, just if you had a question you could ask, what would you ask? I know we all have them. And, you know, maybe they're not given with a poor attitude. Maybe they're just inquiries or curious. But Father, I, I hope each of us have, has reached a place, especially in this very, at times, depressing, discouraging, sin-cursed world that we can trust you. We can depend on you always. And while we may not know why we went through what we went through this past week or the week to come, or that certain year in our life, or whatever it is, Father, uh, we do know that we are a new creation in Jesus Christ. We are never going to be separated from your love. And one day we're going to be free from all the garbage down here, the sin, the death, the destruction, the tension, the hostility. And we are going to enjoy pure, holy bliss. Let us live here with a, a zeal to tell others that good news so that they can one day know what we will know. And Father, also that they have the strength and the peace available to them to get through the days we have here on earth. Ultimately, Father, I pray that we trust you because you are a God who is worthy of our trust. In the name of of that trustworthy one. Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Hey, Matt, how do I stop this? I tapped it and it turned around on me. Oh, so now you're being recorded. Yes. <laughs> All right.